All right. Hey, everybody. Hope you're having yourself a wonderful day wherever you are. Um, morning, afternoon, evening. You know, if you're watching this live with me, with us, I appreciate it. If you're watching the recording, I appreciate the fact that you're taking this time to invest in yourself and that you want to do more with your life other than just suffer in pain and misery. Which brings me to kind of the topic today. Um, you know, basically, what makes people change? We're going to try to discuss continuing yesterday's topic. We're going to get into the body. Uh, we're going to get into movement. Um, kind of discuss about how, like, we continued on. We were talking with Danny yesterday, and Danny uh, mentioned that he likes doing gratitude walks. So, again, walking is really great. So, um, I highly recommend doing some form of physical activity. And if you're having trouble getting outside, you can actually walk up and down your hallway. It might be boring, but I mean, honestly, moving is better than not moving. So if you're gonna like trip mm -hmm. and fall down or whatever, at least you can fall down at home. So I highly recommend getting yourself a, um, a helmet and that will definitely, definitely help you in the whole process. If you're gonna fall down and hit your head because we don't want you hurting yourself and you know there's nothing wrong with taking precautions to be the best version of yourself so give me one second i'll close this door i'll be right back all right thank you thank you thank you it just keeps a little less distractions going on so i can focus on you and so you can have all of my time right now so we're talking about uh you know what really makes people change what gives you uh, what people keeps people from changing it's all like pain pain and pleasure are basic motivators uh, and demotivators so oftentimes you'll find that you know you might be afraid of some pain that comes from the discomfort of trying and learning something new and like we said if you you know when you're a baby they don't give you just an hour or two hours to teach you how to walk or to teach you how to talk, it takes time. So when you learn new skills, you have to realize that there is a process where you fall down and you pick yourself back up, but you learn. It's like, if something doesn't work the first time, you try something else. If that doesn't work, you try something else. If that doesn't work, you try something else. So you get me, shake your head, yes. Say, yes, I got this. I'm gonna keep trying something until I find what is perfect for me. So. These techniques I'm talking about, it's just, it's what's worked for me. And I know with my experience helping other patients and, you know, working on myself, that these are ways that you are able to facilitate your own care. And you want to be able to do stuff that you're comfortable with, but you also need to get out of your comfort zone. Uh, when I was first having all these problems, um, you know, I, was walking around my neighborhood. At first it was kind of short. I did a small little block or two, um, get a little confused, get some focal aware seizure stuff going on. So it was a little scary going out there and worrying about like uh, falling down or hurting myself. But for the most part, I didn't really hurt myself. And if I ever got lost, I knew I had my phone in my pocket. So I could at least do the GPS and say, Siri, take me home. And I could try to follow her home, but I never actually, I ran into that problem. I reached a point where I was doing a nice long circle. It was probably close to two miles, uh, maybe a mile and a half. And I'd always get confused at the same spot. I'd go walking past this uh, junior high school. And I just, all of a sudden, I'm just like, I'm confused. I don't know where I'm at, what I'm doing, but I remained calm. I was like, I do this walk all the time. I know if I just keep walking, I'm going to figure this out. So for me, that worked really well. Also knowing that I had already set up in my phone, like if I was lost, I could go map, home, go, and it would show me the route to keep walking and I could just follow the phone. The phone will tell me. So this is important to make sure that you know what route you're walking. Make sure that you have a way of figuring out where you're at if you do get confused or when you get confused, because you know, it's kind of what happens with epilepsy when you're having seizures. And I found myself in the grocery stores, I'd make out a list that I'd follow. And then I'd, I'd end up reaching a point where I was just 
confused. I, I couldn't, you know, I'm reading epilepsy. So reading the list was kind of hard. The lights were weird and I'd go really early in the morning, but this is like, you know, it was good to get out and to get out of the house and to walk around the store. Uh, but I highly recommend setting yourself a routine where you are doing some physical activity and do this regularly. You can just walk up and down your hallway a bunch of times. If you want to put some music on to make it more fun, I highly recommend making it fun because the more fun it is, the more you're going to do it, the more enjoyable it is. So I don't really want you doing crazy extreme stuff. You don't have to go climb Mount Everest to prove that you can overcome your epilepsy. Um, you got to build up to that. People do not just start climbing Mount Everest without understanding what the perils and the dangers are along the way. Otherwise, they are going to die. So, you know, a lot of people that freeze to death up there, you know, you need requirements of a certain amount of oxygen when you reach a certain height uh, where you can breathe if you haven't been trained. You have like Tibetan monks and stuff that grew, grow up in these places. You have other places around the world that's high ele elevation and people in these areas acclimate by birth from birth to be able to breathe here without having such troubles but if you're from you know a coastal region like myself here uh there's extreme elevations of 7,000 feet or whatever your kilometers are sorry i'm not doing the math right now um you know the they they make it harder on you so you got to understand you know what you need to take care of yourself and i highly recommend if you're worried about falling down and hitting your head get yourself a helmet there's nothing wrong with a helmet uh, lots of warriors wear helmets i wore a helmet when i was in the army protected our head for in case somebody took a pot shot at us and you know hopefully the helmet was going to block the block the bullet assuming it wasn't a giant caliber or a grenade because you know a grenade will blow your head off so yeah I and mean, we don't want you to blow your head off with epilepsy we don't want you to find problems uh, that you cannot solve. We want you to be able to find tools and reasons to do what you need to do. So this is part of the thing. If you wanna set a schedule, honestly, I did my Tai Chi this morning. I didn't get a chance to meditate yet, but I do highly recommend doing some physical activity to help clear your head, calm your body, your nervous system, and you'll be amazed. And you know, throw in some gratitude and it makes the process a lot better. Again, I like music. I highly recommend uh, listening to music when you're stressing out, when you're having problems, when it's not fun enough, when you're stuck in your own thoughts. The best way to change these thoughts that are bothering you is to get up and move, to put some change your mindset, change your mind about whether you want to be stuck on these problems or whether you want to find what the solutions are. And again, yeah, walking is really great. If you can go to the gym and lift weights, that's really awesome. You know, some of us are a little scared about swimming and having a seizure in the water and drowning. So uh, make sure if you're swimming, you got a buddy with you. Uh, you can do flotation devices and stuff. You can go to the pool, whatever, but and make sure that there's somebody watching you when you're putting yourself in situations that might be dangerous for yourself because we want you to live. I want you to live. You want yourself to live because life is amazing. And, you know, my, my friend just died yesterday. So it just reinforces that whole point of like how precious life is, how we just don't know, you know, what it's going to take to, um, to get to the next level or if we're even able to find the next level. And then watching him kind of deteriorate for a little while and it kind of, kind of went a little quickly. Um, but with epilepsy, you know, the nice thing is like we are in charge of ourselves. We're confused sometimes, we're lost sometimes, we're struggling sometimes, but I mean, everybody, everybody is. It's not abnormal to be frustrated with your life. I mean, people without epilepsy are incredibly frustrated with their life. You have all kinds of people that are depressed without epilepsy. You have all kinds of people that are anxious. You have all kinds of people that are struggling with the same emotions and mindsets and lack of desire and improper thoughts to carry them forward in their life. So that's why ultimately it's, you can't expect everybody else to be at a level where, where you're not. And you know just because you're at a certain level doesn't mean you can expect anybody else to be. It's really just, you can't compare yourself to others. You have to make sure you're doing the best you can. And if you're, 
moving around, if you're doing something, it feels good. You need to get your circulation going, your heart rate up. Uh, I, I enjoy doing yoga and some Pilates. I have a foam roller. I highly recommend doing these stretches and breathing and getting into your body, being able to relax and just realize what's going on. And you're going to find some discomforts. And the nice thing is when you find these discomforts, you can start addressing them. But if you're ignoring them, you're going to continue. They're going to turn into a trigger. They're going to turn into a chronic problem. They're going to turn into something you don't want. So say yes, if you got this, you got this, right? You don't want more health problems. You want better health, right? Yes, yes. All right, yes. We want better health in our life. We need a better mindset. And we need to decide what's motivating us to take action because that's what we do. First, we think about what we want and then we take action. So oftentimes we get stuck in the tyranny of how, how am I going to do this? How am I going to get over this? Because we don't know why we want to do it. So that's why we're covering very importantly, why you want to be better. What future do you want to have? What, what relationships would you like to have? Would you like a boyfriend or girlfriend that supports you in this whole process that you can love and support as well? Or do you want somebody who's just going to you know, get resentful because all you do is you yell at them because they're not fulfilling your every desire. So, I mean, that's why I say we're, it's ultimately up to us to choose our own adventure, you know, choose your adventure. You want to be your hero in your story, right? Yes, yes, yes. Hero in your own story. Yes, yes, Alma. Yes, you. We all want to be the heroes in our own story because you need to be. You're the only person that's in your body. You're the only person that knows what hurts, where it aches, you know, what your brain feels like, what your body feels like. And I know after a seizure, I've said so many times, it feels like getting hit by a car. Um, a lot of people, maybe you've been fortunate enough to not be hit by a car, but when I was in the army, I got rear-ended by a tow truck while I was at a complete stop. Um, I was on the freeway. My buddy was in the car with me. Um, we just hear this brake skidding, the air brakes locked up on this, this truck. And we just have enough time to look at each other a bunch of times and brace for it. I ended up knocking the window out with my head and uh, my truck kind of got uh, bent. They bent the frame and we got dinged up. I got, I went to the hospital and because I was in the military, I was actually set up to go on deployment. So I actually went to another country because it was really hard to get this stuff set up and there was no person else that could do it. So I had to go do this injured and I had to make sure I could do this as best as I could. And I got back, I was still struggling. I didn't have any medical care while I was gone. You know, the doctors didn't have much with them. We were, you know, we were in a total, you know, another country, third world country dealing with some third world issues and stuff. And um, honestly, uh, when I got back, I was still injured. I was doing my best that I could to figure out what was going on. The doctors couldn't help me figure out what's going on. And I ended up uh, being told uh, that if I re-enlisted, they were going to throw me out. So I did actually get out so that I didn't get thrown out, uh, medically discharged. I just thought that would look better. I mean, my dad got his back injured when he was in the army and he's kind of a dickhead and he's gone after it. He's Abused the whole system, as far as I'm concerned. I did not want to be like my dickhead dad. So uh, when I got out, I, I learned yoga. I went to college, I learned yoga, and I started meditating. And these two things like really, really helped me find my own health. You know, find repair my back injury where I was able to do a lot more. You know, I've ended up having uh, a couple of injuries, hernia surgeries, and stuff to try to fix the fact that I. I do have some weaknesses that weren't addressed after the surgeries. I do lift a lot of stuff. I, I'm a big guy. And sometimes I think it's just easier. Like I was trained in the army to just, just do it, get it over with and deal with the pain later. But that's not the smart way to do it. Honestly, you really need to pay attention to what's going on with you. Um, I found that when I went to the gym personally, it made it a lot easier for me to have a stronger back. Uh, I gained a lot of weight uh, after my back injury. And this extra weight really didn't help my body at all. And when I finally lost the weight or when I turned the weight into muscles instead of bloated beer fat and whatever poor diet and lack of exercise, when I became you know, more active, when I started going on walks again and 
really just connecting with myself. You know, that was really when I started finding the most healing was able to occur in my body because you know, I was able to pay attention. I was able to breathe through the pain. I was able to find what worked and what didn't because you want to do more of what works and less of what doesn't. Um, and it's incredibly important to make sure you have a routine. Every day, you should be doing something to physically feel better. Every day, you need to be doing something to mentally feel better, to emotionally feel better. You are responsible for you. And if you don't know how, you don't need to get stuck on how, you need to find a who. Who can help me find the way to be the best version of myself? And I'm here to help you out. If it's not me, there are lots of other people inside the community and outside of the community that really can give you answers on how to be the best version of yourself. What exercises are appropriate to you? You know, as an acupuncturist, medical provider, I did my best to provide uh, self-care solutions to the people that were willing to take steps and empower them with tools they didn't know yet. So it's like, this is how you do certain exercises. These are the good exercises for when you have a knee injury or a shoulder injury or when your back's out or, you know, a lot of this stuff I was able to figure out doing yoga because I connected with my own personal body. And I know you can do the same thing too, because I'm not the only one. There's a lot of people that have this story that they took control of their own health that decided that they weren't getting the answers anywhere else and they learned the skills they needed from people that already had them like i didn't just suddenly know yoga i didn't suddenly start being able to sit in full lotus posture i mean i'm telling you it takes a while so i'm gonna tell you a thing about sitting meditation is a lot of work it's a physical activity and if you think about walking for an hour like you get tired so it's a little harder for most people to stand in one place for an hour. If you've ever tried standing in one place for an hour, I know I'm exhausted, right? You're exhausted. Have you tried this? Just stand there doing nothing for one hour and you're standing there. It's exhausting. Uh, same thing can happen when you're sitting there meditating. Sitting there meditating, you've got to maintain your posture. You're not really trying to fall over and fall asleep. You know, ideally, you know, whether... Depending on how you sit, there's a bunch of ways to sit, but you want to be sitting up. You know, you have your low back is actually tight. You're trying to relax upward, but you're like sitting as tall as you can. You want to kind of like sit like you're being held uh, by a marionette, marionette string. Something's holding your head up. You want to be very just up and lifted, and then you kind of relax into this position, but it still requires being active. It requires being aware of your posture. And it requires training your muscles, your stomach, your back, your hips. I mean, you're, you'll feel this in your legs, your shoulders, your neck. It just, it's all connected. So doing a little bit of exercise has a lot of benefits. If you just go for a walk, you know, you get a great benefit. If you can go for a run, you're going to have a better benefit of increasing the strength in your heart. Cardio is really, really good. If you're worried about running, you can do other activities, more yoga little faster if you've ever done sun salutations sun salutations are basically go up and down you go down into push-up mode and lean up and then you go into up dog down dog you go into practice plank and you jump back up and uh and out of a lunge and it, you just the faster you do that the more cardio it is if you want to just do jumping jacks because you have no idea what i'm talking about you can do jumping jacks you can jog in place you can do all kinds of things at home you don't need expensive gym equipment you don't need a yoga mat you don't need to buy anything you you have everything you need it's your mind and your body and then you just got to get your your emotionally connected to find why you want to feel better and why you want to do it so uh Today, the next couple of days, we are going to be just discussing physical part of health. And, you know, activity, again, is so pertinent. And if you don't know what you want to do, if you don't have a plan, you're going to get lost. So you need to make sure you, if you don't know this stuff or you're a little confused, you know, there's apps on your phone you can get that do yoga. Um, you can get work with me and I'll end up helping you get a program that's working with your own health that you can learn, that you can feel comfortable about as you're getting uncomfortable. Because it's how we grow. We got to get a little uncomfortable 
and learn new things. You got to be willing to feel silly, to feel insecure, to feel like, you know, it's new. You, you can't expect to be perfect at something. You know, it actually took me probably a little while, quite a while to be able to sit in one place for 45 minutes to an hour. And even still, I, I get kind of uncomfortable after half an hour. Um, but I needed to build back up to that and I'm working on it. You know, we all have goals that we're trying to work at and we can't compare ourselves to other people. And you can't really compare yourself to who you were before epilepsy because this is just another another version of yourself that that person, you know, had already had their chance to do whatever, but now you have to realize who you are and what you can do about it. Like Ren, you don't want to get stuck on the tyranny of how am I going to feel better? You want to make sure that you understand that you want to get better, why you want to get better, what future it is that you want, and then you can work on how you're going to get there. Who is going to help you get the tools that you need? It's super, super important. So um, pain versus pleasure. This is a lot of the stuff that we also, if you've heard it, like carrot versus the stick, it's like, which way gets you motivated? Are you after this compelling future or are you after getting out of pain? And a lot of us are trying to get out of pain because epilepsy is a lot of mental, physical, and emotional pain, right? Yes, you guys understand this because you're living this hell too. So epilepsy sucks. We can all agree, right? Yes, we all agree epilepsy sucks. Okay, so we're in this one together. Epilepsy sucks, but it doesn't have to. And I know it's scary trying to figure stuff out and being confused in this process. We talk about it. So I did talk about doing the Epsi app to make sure that you're monitoring what you're doing. So you can kind of put a little bit of your plan in for the week. If you've got appointments, you want to make sure you have it in the schedule. It says, hey, look, I'm doing this. You know, it's really good to, to have your food planned out in advance because I know when I'm a little confused, I'm not sure what to eat and sometimes I'll miss a meal and or I have some go to stuff that I just eat because I'm not sure what else to do because, you know, I, I forget sometimes to plan out uh, the day. Uh, I rely a little bit too much on, on my girlfriend sometimes and you know she's not always capable of facilitating uh, what I what I desire. You know, she does what she can. And so if I want something more, it's really up to me can't be like, baby, you didn't give me what I wanted. Like, this is uh, up to me and it's up to you. So you get that, right? It's up to you to make sure you get what you want and you get what you need. And you can't expect everyone else to be like bending over backwards just because your feelings are hurt. Um, there's a lot of people that go through a lot of stuff, a lot of problems. And if you remembered yesterday, I mentioned this guy, but I forgot his name. It was the gentleman with no legs and one arm and end up doing some wrestling and winning stuff because he cut off his one lip arm that was limiting him and holding him back. It was a mindset. His name is actually Nick Santos Santos. Just want to make sure that uh, you guys knew. I knew who I was talking about. He's a great guy, but yeah, I was a little stressed out yesterday just dealing with uh, Glenn passing away. So um, it's all right. Um, there are amazing people out there. There are a lot of people that overcome their challenges and these limitations. Like we were talking with Danny yesterday. He's got his own issues physically. He's got epilepsy. He's got swelling on the brain from water. You know, his first surgery didn't go very well, but you know, he had a surgery here, I believe it was this year, earlier this year, that went way better for him. He's had a few checkups on it and a few, few issues where he's had to have it fixed. But like seriously, because of you know, his mindset he's been able to continue forward on his journey with the gratitude and find tools and take action to improve his life as well. So we all have to live with whatever it is that we have going on with this. I have some multiple um, diagnosis, diagnosis, I'm bipolar. Um, I know there's a lot more going on to me right now than just that, but that's been a big one. I had a bunch of women that broke up with me or said they couldn't handle my bipolar even though that was really, you know, I was doing my best to manage my triggers and I would tell them, hey, look, this is a trigger for me. And then I kind of felt like it was used against me because they knew how to trigger me. And then uh, 
you know, just a lot of narcissistic abuse or low intelligence, low emotional intelligence often comes into play with people. So they will attack you for trying to explain, hey, look, if you do this to me, I have no control over the response. Uh, but that's why you work at it. You've got to work at being the best version of yourself. And you can't expect that people are going to always have your back because people are people. The doctors are doctors. The nurses are nurses. Your teachers at school were teachers. Your, you know, if you go to church, like these people all have their mindsets and their own own realm of what is possible. And they don't live with epilepsy. They don't know what's possible for you. They only know that uh, they want you to be better and they don't always have the tools to help you. So again, this is why you have to figure out what makes you tick. You know, what activities feel good to you? you now, what activities don't? You know, when I started off, I was actually having a seizure taking a shower. Um, I know it's horrible. So I, there's a lot of times I don't go uh, bathing every day. There's been some times I've gone months without bathing. I just talk about sebum which is our body's natural oils that build up on us and it helps protect us from disease and stuff. And taking a shower is actually every day is not really that great for your health or for your skin, um, especially when they put different things in the water, but we'll talk about that some other day. Um, but yeah, I was having a seizure just from the part of my brain that was being affected. That's the parietal lobe affects sensory. So that was giving me a seizure. I was like having a problem just listening to somebody else take a shower, you know, and that was giving me a seizure. I was sleeping and the wind would come in the window and hit the back of my neck while I'm sleeping and I would have a seizure. You know, I'd try to get the window closed, but the person I was with refused to uh, facilitate that with me. And so I actually had to remove this person from my life because they kept placing their comfort over my health. And you'll find that it sucks, that you can love somebody, but they're just not right for you. And that you have to take care of yourself, regardless of whether these piece of people are awesome for you or not. Um, finding activities that help you. I mean, sitting in a bath is a lot easier for me because there's no pounding on my skin. The changes in, from going into the water and out of the water aren't as extreme. So my brain trying to process all of these things just uh, it was really hard. And you might have this problem too. There's, you know, there's a lot of us, there's a lot of triggers for a lot of different people. So if you don't have a problem with taking a shower, who knows? Congratulations. But that's good to know that it's possible for someone else. So when you're dealing with somebody else that has epilepsy, you can understand that you might not have the problem, but there's just some really crazy stuff that can happen, especially when the brain goes sideways. So I like to call them overloads because they basically feel like, like I said yesterday, you're incredibly powerful. Your cells generate 0.6 volts. Like you seriously running 7.3 trillion volts through your body on a cellular level. You know, your brain is basically a quantum computer, a uh, way that we're able to process things. We have a left brain and a right brain. And it's thought mostly that you know, your left brain is more logical and your right brain is more uh, artistic. Uh, I call it our entropy. Imagination comes from the right side. Um, but it, uh, there's actually a blend that goes on between them a little bit. So it's not quite as extreme. So when you lose one side, you can compensate a little bit more with the other side. Or when you're struggling in one part, your other half will, will attempt to compensate. Um, there's some studies and stuff where they do surgery and they separate the left and the right brain and they have, um, they understand just how it works when they are, you know, separated, when they're not connected and you're just running off of one lobe over, over the other. You have people that have parts of their brain are removed. It's an option. Uh, if you're dealing with some of the doctors and they want to do surgery on you, it's an option to have something, a lesion cut out or have a part of your brain cut out or, you know, just have it, you know, they used to do something where they'd basically do like a frontal lobotomy or they'd do some damage to your frontal lobe and it would stop giving people the shaking seizure, seizures, but they would also stop having higher brain function. So you're basically alive, but you're a vegetable. So 
So the frontal lobe is responsible for movement. And basically when you're dealing with the right side of your brain, it's responsible for the left side of your body when it comes to movement and sensory. And so for me, you know, my right brain is uh, kind of been my problem when it goes full blown general, it's a little harder to deal with, but it also it goes my right brain side and down my left. So I have stroke like symptoms where I get some weakness, some aphasia, some difficulty talking. These are like physical problems. You, need, you want to be able to talk to people. You want to be able to listen to people. But I seriously couldn't listen to people. I couldn't hear the noises. Couldn't understand what's going on. I'm like, I'm confused. These words don't make sense. And I'm hoping the words I'm using make sense. Because at that time, there was definitely, I understand I said things wrong. Or I said things that I wasn't, I didn't mean. I was trying to say something, but it was just coming out wrong. And then if you try to correct yourself, you know, some of these people think you're lying to them or like, why are you changing your story? I'm like, no, I'm really just trying to get the right story out because my brain is messed up. And, you know, if you don't understand how your brain can go sideways, I mean, you're not going to be able to explain to people what's going on with your brain. Um, so I was interested in showing you guys a little bit today about um, brain step, brain health, um, what we can do uh, to understand your brain. I've got a nice little app here. If I can find it real quick. Um, probably put it in my medical folder. So bear with me for a second. I appreciate it. 3D Brain. This is an app you can download. I don't remember. I probably paid a little bit for it. I'm going to do a share screen real quick so you can see this. Um, all right. All right, here is the whole brain. So you're gonna notice here on the left, you've got your little pink spot. This is the frontal lobe. Um, then you've got your paradial lobe. Well, paradial lobe is a little kind of green spot. You got the temporal lobe, your occipital and your limbic system. So it's a little, it's a cool little diagram here. You can check this out. It's gonna show you the other half all the way through. So. Again, you can see that there's something there connecting the two. It's really important. These allows the two parts of the brain to communicate with each other. You can see that split down the middle. So this is the frontal lobe. Then you got the paradial lobe. You got the temporal lobe, the occipital lobe, and the limbic system. So you got brain stem down here. And uh, this is actually pretty, pretty fascinating stuff. So. We're going to click on the frontal lobe. Um, we have some options down here to check out different parts of the brain. Um, Broca's, this is actually affects your speech. So I um, wasn't really trying to get into too many of the small details, but we can get into this later. So here's your frontal lobe. You know. Um, so right here, the frontal lobe is part of the cerebral cortex and is are the largest of the brain structures. They are the main site of so-called high cognitive functions. The frontal lobe contains a number of important structures, including the prefrontal cortex, orbitofrontal cortex, motor and premotor cortexes, and Broca's area. These substructures are involved in attention and thought, voluntary movement, decision-making, and language. So, you realize you, if you're having a problem with your frontal lobe, anything going on with movement and language and stuff can be affected. Um, as you can see, there's a couple different sections here that come into play, the front part. Uh, the motor part is more of the green and the yellow area. Um, but again, you, if you damage this area, you have problems with some of your higher functions. If you're having seizures from here, you're not, you're not gonna be thinking straight. When your brain goes sideways, it goes sideways. So I know, you know what I'm talking about when you're living with epilepsy, right? Yes, just say yes, I understand. It sucks when my brain goes sideways, but I did not know this, it's okay. But we're gonna continue helping you understand the different parts of your brain. And so we're gonna get over here. Uh, we're gonna jump down to the limbic system. This is like basically your fight or flight. This is survival mode. This is uh, it's important. 
to kind of help deal with the limbic system. So as an overview, the limbic system is a group of brain structures, including the amygdala, the hippocampus, and the hypothalamus that are involved in processing and regulating emotions, memory, and sexual arousal. The limbic system is an important element in the body's response to stress and highly connected to the endocrine and autonomic nervous systems. The limbic system is also responsible for processing the body's response to odors. So, right? It means if you're getting weird smells, sometimes people have auras and they come in as a weird smell. This is it. Sometimes you get hypersexual. This is the area. You can be lack of sexuality. It's going to be part of this brain, this part. So you can understand there's a lot that can go along. And if you realize like, hey, look, I'm having a problem. These are one of the things that come up. You can talk to your doctor or your provider, or you can work on these things, learn different exercises. We have acupuncture techniques to stimulate certain parts of your scalp to be able to help stimulate parts of your brain. We, it's mostly used right now for uh, stroke recovery. There's some amazing stuff that comes out of that. So I know that this is going to work way, really, really good if you have this available in your location and it's not always available in everybody's location and not all acupuncturists understand how to do scalp acupuncture, but I would like to change that in the future and help give them a class. So let's see, we're gonna go with the occipital lobe is the next in order. So this is that back part right there. The occipital lobe is mostly about vision inner vision as well as outer vision so when you close your eyes and you're dreaming you know when you have rem sleep it's rapid eye movement your occipital lobe is responsible for this movement of your eyes so the occipital cortex is the primary visual area of the brain it receives projections from the retina via the thalamus from where different groups of neurons separately encode different visual information such as color, orientation, and motion. Pathways from the occipital lobe reach the temporal and parietal lobes and are eventually processed consciously. Two important pathways of information originating in the occipital lobe are the dorsal and ventral streams. The dorsal stream projects to the parietal lobes and processes where the objects are located. The ventral stream projects to structures in the temporal lobes and processes what objects are. So this is where you process where things are and what you call them. So, um, you know, we call a bike a bike, but if somebody says wheel and you point at the bike, you might not know they're talking about, you might think they're calling the bike a wheel unless you've specified this part of the bike. So this is where we process things. If you're not sure what to call things, you know, this is the part of your brain that's kind of messing up as well. If you're having trouble seeing stuff, if you're having visual hallucinations, you know, this is the part of your brain. Um, I know it gets kind of scary dealing with your brain going sideways. So here is the parietal lobe. You know, it's behind the frontal lobe. You see, there's the frontal lobe here. It's not the colored out, but parietal lobe, we got the red and purples. So left, these are the parts of the parietal lobe. So parietal lobe here, parietal cortex plays an important role in integrating information from different senses to build a coherent picture of the world. It integrates information from the ventral visual pathways which process things that are, that, like we mentioned, the, the dorsal visual pathway. And uh, this allows us to coordinate our movements in response to objects in our environment. So it helps you figure out depth perception and stuff. Um, contains a number of distinct references maps of the body, near space, distant space, which are constantly updated as we move and interact with the world. Again, this helps us perceive what's going on with this. It helps us sense the world. So parietal complex processes, attentional awareness of the environment is involved in manipulating objects and representing numbers. So if you're having trouble 
holding on to something because you can't quite grasp it right. This is a lot of it. I uh, was having trouble playing piano like after I developed epilepsy. So I had to retrain my brain uh, how to not just move it with the frontal lobe, but like where the keys and my fingers are supposed to be. The reference points of that was a little messed up. So I had to relearn you know, how to play instruments. Honestly, if you're trying to work on your brain, two of the best things you can do for yourself is learn a language, learn a new language, practice a language, or learn an instrument. These both are great ways to help improve memory and strengthen your brain's functions. So, now we're just gonna, probably the last one we're gonna cover right now is gonna be the temporal lobe. These are just the major parts of your brain. So you, you wanna know this stuff. You can see right here on the side, here is your temporal lobe. It looks a little yellow, green, blue, and purple. So there are different parts of this structures within the structures, but these are the main lobes. So the temporal lobe contains a large number of structures whose functions include perception, face recognition, object recognition, memory acquisition, understanding language, and emotional reactions. So damage to the temporal lobe can result in intriguing neurological deficits called agnosias, which refers to the inability to recognize specific categories, body parts, colors, faces, music, smells. So as you can see, uh, I have some temporal lobe epilepsy. This is kind of one of my major ones here. Um, can talk about not being able to understand things. I lost some memories uh, from the subragic stroke um, from one of my seizures. And uh, there's just stuff I really still don't remember. Um, sometimes it's nice when people will talk to me about things that uh, my brain doesn't let me access because sometimes I'm able to uh, Reaccess some of them, and other times it's just nice to hear something other something about what I forgot. Um, try not to feel bad about that one, but you know, you're forgetting body parts, colors, faces, music, smells, and it. You can see how this uh, can affect your brain. Just your epilepsy can do some crazy stuff to you. Um, See real quick, was there anything else I really wanted to cover? Okay, so inside these, these are some more structures to deal with, but I mean, I'm more than happy to go over that at another point with you if you are interested in learning more about uh, an in-depth process of the brain. I can hold another class for you guys later, but for right now, um, I hope you understand that the brain is incredibly powerful. And I'm going to stop sharing here. All right, cool. Thanks. The brain is powerful. The brain does so much for us. It's, you know, organic computer that allows us to experience reality. It allows us to hold memories. It allows us to experience the world around us, you know, and when you have misfirings going on, when, when you're, when you're dealing with the process, it can be hard and it can be confusing and it can be scary and it can be frustrating. And the whole fact that you don't know what to do is understandable because I experienced this all the time or did like in the beginning, I was really confused. And now I just occasionally have confusion. I have trouble still looking for some stuff. I get a little stressed out when I set something down and I can't find it. Yesterday, I literally couldn't find my sunglasses. So I had to use a different pair. Uh, I couldn't find my backup pair. So I went with some green ones and I went out on my walk. And when I was done with my walk, I was a little bit confused. I was a little struggling because the, the green light didn't filter the same way as my brown lenses do. The brown lenses, I like copper lenses. I've discovered this for myself. Uh, you can check out Oakley's website and try a couple different lenses if you're interested in finding something that works better for your eyes. Um, everybody's different. The blue bothers me, so I don't like black lenses because it's actually a blue color that's just been darkened. Um, but brown and copper are my favorite. So I can use green at night. It's a nice one. Yellow works for if you don't have a blue light monitor. Uh, I highly recommend you have some blue light glasses and they usually come in yellow and they have a night version that come in red. 
So that really helps at night when you're trying to get out of hypervigilance so you can go to sleep, try to get your brain to shut down if you're still staring at electronics and stuff. Um, I highly recommend that you stop staring at electronics uh, about a couple hours before you go to bed. But I understand that uh, just because you know that you should do something doesn't mean that you will. I mean, I'm just as guilty as playing video games until I go to bed or trying to watch uh, some something educational or just something to kind of distract me from my problems. We've done that before, right? Yes. Distracted myself. Yes, Alma, I know about distracting myself and ignoring myself. All right. We all do this. You, you know, I, I know I'm not alone in this. You're not alone in this. This is the human condition. It's not your brain. It is the brain. We all have the brain. And we got to decide what we're going to feed in it. Like we we're saying, there's the, the part that says make better choices and the part that says go seek pleasure. You know, instead of finding a way out of your problem, ignore it. Find something to satisfy the discomfort. So what you need to do is find out how to be so uncomfortable that it moves you forward into better choices because you want better results, which is why we talk about this compelling future that you want. I mean, there's there's got to be more to your life that you want. I mean, there's got to be more than just saying, hey, I want to be a disabled person, miserable and unhappy, confused all the time, having seizures because I don't know how to treat myself better. But you can, and it's easy enough, but you just really need to, like I said, make up your mind and start to take action and understand that like you're going to fall down sometimes and you're going to get back up. In the process of learning, is making a bunch of mistakes. You say, I uh, can't remember how that phrase goes, but for the most part, you, know, you, you can't learn if you're not willing to make mistakes. You can't do better and grow if you're not willing to go through some discomfort. We have growing pains. I know when I was a child, uh, I grew really fast, uh, I'm currently six foot three, and I've been this height since about 13, 14. So I've been the size of a full grown man at a very young age. And I have stretch marks down my knees. Uh, my knees hurt from when I was growing. When I went into the army, we did a bunch of push ups. Uh, I didn't, had never done so many push ups. I'd like lifted weights and stuff, but I'd never done so many push ups. And I have stretch marks down my arms and chest here just from my chest muscles growing. And I can tell you that was uncomfortable doing all those push-ups. I was exhausted all the time. And when I took a week off from doing push-ups, my push-ups actually went up 10. I improved from 37 to 47 or whatever it was. I think it was something like that. And as the process is, you got to give yourself time to heal and recover. So if you're pushing all the time, you're wearing yourself all the time, you're going to stay kind of worn out. So it's important to find the balance of like where you are, where you're at. If you need to take a nap, take a nap. If you need to listen to some music and dance, listen to some music and dance. Like it's important to make sure that you balance these things out in your life. Activity and rest of the, the physical body, of the mental strains. You know, it's okay to want to distract yourself, but make sure that you aren't pushing yourself past the threshold because this is how you strengthen your body. You find what the threshold is. I highly recommend some brain stimulating activities. Video games have scientifically been proven to help with hand-eye coordination as well as uh, you have a lot of smarter people because of the fact that they've been dealing with this. I know some people that will play until they have a seizure and they ignore the fact that they're going to have a seizure and they're just going to get back on and they're going to keep having seizures. And they haven't really seemed to improve very well because instead of acknowledging that their body has limitations and that they need to pay attention to it, they're still telling their brain, no, I'm not going to listen to you. I'm not your friend. I'm going to do what I want. Screw you. And so their brain just says, cool, you're not listening to me. Screw you too. And then they have, they have seizures that just, they can't get under control. So what you need to do is make sure you're taking a break. If it's watching TV, you got to take a break. You know, if you're reading a book, take a break. Whatever it is that you're doing, make sure that you're taking a break. If you're working really hard, if you are able to go to your job, if you're struggling with this and you're having seizures, you got to understand, you got to slow down a little bit and make sure that when you're 
you're having a little difficulties, you take a break for yourself and just say, hey, look, I need a break. And you go do it and honor it. I know it sucks, but it's worse than it's better than having a seizure and losing like the rest of your day or your weekend or your week because you didn't listen to your body. And if you haven't figured these things out, if you don't know what's physically going on when you're having a seizure, I think I recommended before, you can get yourself a nice little camera, a little Wi-Fi closed circuit one that you can actually record, have memory card on the side of it. It'll record like 30 days worth of stuff for you. They make bigger memory cards. Uh, they have different cameras. I'm sure there's better ones than this, but I'm, this one's been nice. I have a couple of these. Uh, these are by Genie, which is G-E-E-N-I. But man, there's a lot of different cameras that you can have to help watch and record what's going on with you. If you're concerned about having seizures in your sleep, like these are low light modes. So it can actually catch what's going on with you. And you can actually look or share this with someone else about what's physically going on. You know, if you're worried about falling down and getting hurt, you can share this camera with other people so they can check in on you, even if they're not physically there with you. They can, you know, hey, notice that you're on the floor or whatever and try to get you some help, um, try to come over and help you, whatever it is that's going on, because we're all at different stages in this. Um, and you have to figure out where at you are on the map to recovery. So map to recovery is incredibly important. <laughs> so when I was in the army, uh, I was with the uh, community, I did support for the special forces and we were given a map one day. So my buddy and I had this map and we were supposed to go to three places and we we're supposed to look for what I was hidden in these three places is basically a code and we we're supposed to come back and share, uh, tell them what the codes were at all three places. And um, so we, we had this map, we had an idea of where we wanted to go. We had a compass and we knew where we were on the map. And that was really, really important because if we didn't know where we were on the map, we were gonna have to start trying to find references from what the map was to like what was around us. So we didn't exactly know what everything meant on the map because there was the period where, um, I didn't know what was going on with the map. Can you close that baby? That light is bothering me. Um, so we didn't, when we were on the map or we trying to deal with the map, like we didn't know exactly where we were going. We thought we were gonna take this shortcut. It looked really easy um, to just kind of cut through this spot. And we did not understand what the perils were. We had the map, but we didn't really understand what everything meant on it. So we, we wasted a lot of time going through this spot that if we would have just gone around this spot, it would have saved us a lot of time, but we decided to go take a shortcut, the most direct route, and it ended up being the hardest way to get to where we were trying to go. So um, we were chopping at little spots, trying to climb through. And this was a lesson and an understanding that, you know, just because you have a map and some of the tools, you still require some orientation and some understanding of what the perils could mean for you. If somebody would have told us, hey, look, that right there on the map means thick brush. You should go around it because it's full of thorns and you're never gonna get anywhere. Then we would have totally gone around that and saved ourselves the time and trouble of going through all of this. So it's important to have a map and it's important to understand where you're going and how you are going to get there. So this is why you wanna make sure that you're doing yourself a routine. You know, you know what it is that you're gonna be eating every day. You know what time you're gonna be eating every day. It's good to know what time you go to bed and what time you get up. If you have to take naps and you have to be very flexible about this stuff, because if you're too rigid about everything, it's going to be really hard. And like, you're just going to really frustrate yourself. I mean, you understand this, right? You've been frustrated and trying to say, I, I'm going to do this. And then it goes sideways because you, you don't pay attention or you weren't taught what the perils were or anything along the way. So again, having a map is important. Having a framework to work with, you know, having structure in your life actually frees you 
from having to think about what am I going to do next? Because you don't have to think about it. You just go, oh, yeah, it's Tuesday. Tuesday, I got to go. Uh, today's day, Wednesday, but you know, Wednesday, Wednesday, we got to go over here to see the doctor. Okay. And then I got to make sure I go do my exercise. I'm going to meet up with my personal trainer. If you're lucky enough to have a personal trainer to help you doing your exercises, it's good. You know, these people help keep you motivated. And, you know, if you're paying a personal trainer, oftentimes you're not going to miss out on your gym time. And it's because somebody's expecting you to be there and you're paying for it, which is the same thing about mentorship. When you invest in yourself, when you put money towards your goals, you're going to put your time into it because people don't really like wasting their money. Uh, they seem to waste their time more, but they don't want to waste their money. And the problem is uh, time is not a renewable resource. We're limited on the time we have to do everything. We all have the same 24 hours in the day, but we don't all have the same ability to accomplish the same level of intense work or whatever in that 24 hours. We have to ex we have to understand where we're at what we're capable of and work at that. And if we don't like where we're at, we have to make ourselves physically stronger, physically capable of doing more, doing the exercises, finding that threshold, and then taking a break. And you know, Chinese medicine and Taoist philosophy and China, and we talk about yin and yang. And so if you don't know what these words mean, yang is basically activity, yin is basically rest. There's a lot more to this concept, you know, things kind of have this blend of a little bit of both. And so that's where, uh, you, if you ever seen the symbol of uh, the yin and yang symbol, you've got like basically an extreme spot, black, white on the top, black on the bottom. And in the center of the white on the top, there's a seed of the black and the bottom of the black, there's a seed of the white is and these extreme points is where it starts to pivot again into the other. So what goes up must come down. What comes down must go up. Everything is more of a sound wave. So if you've ever watched the way that sound waves work, you ever watched your heart beat on a monitor, your brain waves on a monitor, they're waves. Everything is a wave. It goes up and down and up and down. And when we have spikes too high or spikes too low, that's when things have problems, when you're not doing very well because we need to make sure that in this waveform that we're trying to moderate ourselves, trying to moderate our stress, trying to moderate our activity, trying to moderate our thoughts, our very sense, our joy. So you need to make sure that you are taking care of yourself like you matter, doing the best that you can to be the best version of yourself and have the patience to understand that none of us are perfect and it takes time to learn how to crawl and then walk and then run. We don't start off talking at the age of baby comes out goo goo gaga and then other noises and stuff but eventually you know you master the skill of being able to walk you master the skill of being able to communicate you you've learned how to do things you've been able to learn how to write a letter to somebody or you've learned how to ride a bicycle uh, some of you have learned how to ride a car some of you haven't learned how to drive a car yet and if you can get your brain under control by paying attention to it, you'll be able to start doing way more than you could before. And I know this because, you know, I was struggling driving. I wasn't supposed to be driving, doing stuff. I made sure my trips were short because if they were long, I was going to have a trouble. But when I got out of the crappy environment, when I got out of the stress and the problems that I had going on in my life, I drove from Los Angeles all the way up to. Sacramento. And I must tell you, it was really, really hard. Um, I had to basically felt like I was keeping my seizure at a migraine for six hours. I was just pressing into my thumb, into my eye right here, pressure point and following the guy in front of me because he was, he helped come down to LA to help get me up out of where I was at and try to see if I could do better in nature with him and his family. And you know, it was not very healthy mentally or emotionally. So it definitely had an effect on my physical health. You know, I ended up having a seizure um, on Thanksgiving because I was helping his wife do Thanksgiving dinner and he was yelling at her because we were getting along. Uh, basically, 
didn't eat dinner with them. She brought me a turkey sandwich the next day. And that was literally the last time I ate meat for about a year. So my brain rewired itself and said, hey, dude, no more eating meat. I was I went to a homeless shelter after that. And I was vegan. I was making my own food and stuff while I was there. So fortunately, I had the understanding of how to cook and survive this stuff because I'd been vegan before. Um, so it was challenging and it's always challenging, but I had the tools. I already learned them. I had to learn them previously for other purposes in my life. So you can do these things. You can learn things you didn't know before and you can start doing things that you couldn't do before. So I mean, I've, I've done all kinds of driving down to Mexico. I've been back up to Washington. And as long as I'm managing my stress and managing the problems is, that they bring up, as long as I'm taking my time and slow down and recognize that I have limitations, even if I have goals that are beyond my limitations, it takes time to build up for it. Uh, I was actually at a class. We're going to let you go here real soon. I was at a class. I went and flew from Santa Barbara to Orlando, Florida. Uh, I had no drugs, no people, no nothing that has no off button, no protection, no safety net. It was just entirely me with the best of intentions saying, I'm going to go make this work for me. And I could have definitely been afraid of everything that could have gone wrong in this whole process. You know, I could have easily had a seizure, could have easily given myself a seizure if I was focused on all the things that could go wrong. But I thought about how amazing it was. And even with flashing lights, I had to take a break. I took my head down, take some breaths. I worked through it. And, you know, I always wear this visor. So it keeps a lot of the extra light, all the extra movement and stuff down. So it's a little easier for my brain. So these are tools that you can do. Sunglasses to kind of keep your light down. I wear earplugs, noise canceling headphones. These are things that you can physically do to help your body feel safer uh, when you're dealing with things. And things are stressful, when things are loud, when it's too much, it's up to you to find what the tools are that help you. Again, I highly recommend earplugs. My favorite earplugs are actually made by Mac. Uh, here's some orange ones. They're nice, soft, squishy. You roll them up, shove them in your ear. Uh, my other favorite ones are actually some gel earplugs. So I got a couple left in here so I can show you. This is like a used pack, but if you can see without the light messing that up, there are two of these right here. You just roll it up, put it over your ear instead of in it. And it's kind of nice because you don't have that pressure of something inside your ear. Uh, and still, it does an amazing job of knocking out a lot of the sound, but yeah, too, a lot of bass will still get through anything. That's just the way that the bass will go through walls. Bass is actually what carries noise through the walls. So if you turn the bass down on your stereo, uh, that's kind of what you get when you do night mode, when you're listening to music and watching the TV and stuff. So reducing the bass helps reduce the sounds and noises and stuff. So, all right. I'm gonna let you go you, so you can process all of this. So um, I'm gonna see you back here tomorrow. We're gonna continue a little bit more about the physical health and what you can do to maintain physical health. So hopefully you have yourself a wonderful day and enjoy it as best as you can. So if you have any comments, feel free to leave them and we will address them tomorrow or we'll address them in a future series. So thank you for watching and have yourself a beautiful day.